Well, now you get to hear from me. I'll try to keep it short, but I'm not known for doing that, am I? I I could try. As I tell everybody, it's as long as the Lord leads. If he keeps giving me ideas, which he does every week, what can I say? (laughs) It's good to be here, isn't it? It's exciting. I was thinking about this day and realized... I've been here for one-fifth of the time of the history of the church. No wonder why my knees feel old. But today, as I come before you, I'm in my wheelhouse because we're talking history. Those of you who don't know, I was an American history major in college. Until God called me differently, I, my dream was to go get a PhD in American history, colonial American history, and teach collegians, young, hungry minds. But here's the deal. I could make it real boring, but I don't want today's message to be boring. Just a lecture of church history, you know, but rather I want us to see the journey of people of faith who believed in Jesus Christ and followed Jesus Christ. The story of this church is a a story over five to six generations. And so that's when I came, you know, I was preparing the message and I was getting some ideas and God kept saying, go to Chronicles, go to the building of the the temple and David and Solomon. And I said, no, that doesn't fit, Lord. This morning, he beat me over the head with it, so I'm going to give you the verse anyway. So, Think about this. This is one of the purposes of why we study history, especially godly history. Learn to know the God of your ancestors intimately. That's exactly what David says to his son, Solomon. He says, worship and serve him with your whole heart and a willing mind, for the Lord your God sees every heart and knows every plan and thought. Isn't that amazing? To get to know God intimately. You see, I believe that when God casts a vision, and by the way, let's just simply define it. A vision is God's preferred future. What God would like this church to do, or what God would like you to do individually. So God casts a vision in the hearts of people. He stirs the hearts to do his will. And we think about that, how many times in the Bible do we see stories of God giving a vision to someone? I mean, he gave Joseph some dreams or visions of the future to which his brothers didn't like and sold him into slavery. Little did they know that it was all God's plan. He gave Daniel a vision of the future several times. But I was really intrigued by one of Job's friends, Elihu, he speaks to Job about how God speaks, and he says, he speaks in dreams and visions of night when deep sleep falls on people, and they lie in their beds. And there's a purpose, Elihu reveals. He rescues them from the grave so they may enjoy the light of life. The purpose of a vision, the purpose of what God tries to do in every generation is to create a people of God who are lifesavers. We're lifeguards. We are on a mission to rescue people from the gates of hell to all eternity. By the way, Ezekiel had several visions too, and I just, I just like the book of Ezekiel. And God revealed to him God's plan, and I, I love two of them because I think they fit our story And the first one is the Valley of the Dry Bones. You know, Ezekiel sees this plain, and laying out there on the plain is nothing but sun-bleached bones. No skin, no flesh, no organs, just dry, rotting bones. Absolutely no life. And the Lord speaks. And he said to me, Speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover your skin and I will breathe into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me, and suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise across the whole valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Wow. Bodies were formed. Muscles started to form. Skin covering the muscles started to form. 
The bones were no longer just empty. And then God spoke to Elijah, speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breathe from the four winds, breath, breathe into these dead bodies so that they may live again. I almost wanted to say bones, but think about that. Because the wind moved and all of a sudden the breath of life was breathed into every new body that had just been reformed. And that points us to Genesis because what did God do? He created man in his image and then it says he breathed in him the breath of life. God goes on to make his point to Ezekiel. He says, I will open the graves of your lives. I will redeem you from exile. I will put my spirit in you and you will live again. I love that because we live in a community where there are people out there who are dead. And they need life breathed back into them. And it's our job to breathe life into them through asking the Holy Spirit to touch their life. To breathe in them the breath of life. The second vision in Ezekiel that I really like is really, it's the image of the stream of water flowing from the ark of God. And it starts real small. And it meanders and it turns. And everywhere as it goes, it gets wider and deeper. But everywhere the water touches Things spring to life. Fruit bear fruit in season. Wherever the water of the Holy Spirit and the power of God goes, it brings life. That's why Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, he said, you know, I'm thirsty. Can you give me a drink? And she says, well, wait, wait a second. You're a Jew. Why would you ask me, a Samaritan woman? And then he says, uh, well, anybody who drinks this water from this well will thirst again. But if you drink of what I will offer you, you will never be thirsty again, for you will have a spring of living water dwelling within you. Friends, in our community, there are people who are literally dead in their sins. They're in exile in their sins. They're, they're spiritually dead. They're people without hope. They're people who are angry. There are people who are in desperate need of stuff. They're, they're hooked to a different addictions. Because they're trying to find a way to find contentment and peace in their life. And God asks the church to breathe into them through prayer the wind of the Holy Spirit to offer them the living water of Christ so that dwelling within them can be a spring of living water so they may never ever thirst again. We are supposed to be living in such a way that the spring of that living water is flowing out of us and flows out into our lives and penetrates into the community just like that river in Ezekiel. So everywhere we touch, we're bringing the living power of God to change a life, to help a life, to encourage a person. You see, that is actually the church's mission down through all the years. In every generation, the church has asked to do what? Connect people to Jesus. In some form or another, we're to connect them to Jesus. We're supposed to help them breathe into their spiritually dead bodies new life. By the way, Paul was hating the church. He thought that those Christians were just, you know, hypocrites, um, her heretics, so he goes on the mission, right? Because he's going to clean up. He's going to take his religious zeal and clean up the mess. But then God revealed a vision to Ananias as he's revealing a vision to Paul himself. And, he, and God says to Ananias, now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias and the Lord spoke to him in a vision. Ananias? Yes, Lord, he replied. Go to Straight Street to the house of Judas when you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so that he can see again. Now, Ananias has all sorts of objections. Hey, hey, hey God, did you forget this guy's killing people like me because we believe in you? And God says to him, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and the kings as well as to the people of Israel. 
And I think that's important for us to know because the call of God to us individually and to the church as followers of Jesus Christ has always been to take the message of Jesus Christ out into the community. That's our calling. Vision, God's preferred future for us, God's direction for our life begins in the heart. And I love this uh, statement I found. There it is. Vision always begins in the heart with a burden to see something better for the lives of the people you serve. And literally that is where the story of First Baptist Church slash Clay Elm Community Church begins. Because there was a man by the name of Thomas Milborn Jones, early pioneer in the settling of Clay Elm, uh, justice of the peace, did a lot of marriages, they said. He very prominent in everything he did. He moved to America from England at age 19, he worked in the mines in Pennsylvania for a season, and then he moved west to Rosalind, arriving in 1886. And upon arriving, he joined First Baptist Church Rosalind. And after getting married to Isabella, he decides to move to Clay Elum in 1896. And there he opened a general merchandising store. By the way, it was on South Pennsylvania Avenue. Think of it this way. South Pennsylvania Avenue is the block where Pioneer Coffee, for all you coffee addicts, are, is. That's South Pennsylvania Avenue. He um, starts to expand the business. A couple years later, he um, was criticized for opening another store in the woods, which was actually where Clay Elm Drugs was, and now there's a restaurant there right next to the Telephone Museum, right here on First Street. That was the woods back then. And um, Thomas Jones, though, had a burden laid on his heart by God. He believed that what was going on in Clay Elum needed to have a response that a Baptist church needed to be founded. So people gathered in his living room, and they sought God's will. The history records that they actually were on their knees seeking, they used the word supplication, how many ever use the word supplication anymore? So, they were beseeching God, crying out to God. And when the prayer meeting got done, they believed God was leading in the found First Baptist Church of Clayhill. Wow. So, with the help of the Rosalind Baptist Church, who donated the bell, which I believe is still in our bell tower from the best of history tells us, they gave us the communion cloths and tables and hymnals. That they really helped out. They sent volunteers down to help. And there we are, October 21st, 1899. First Baptist Church has found it. And on this map here, the location of where we are founded is that little yellow star. You see it there? And you see the, what is now the Garden Court condominiums. That's the corner of second and right. Townhomes now sit there. That's where our first building was. Building program shortly followed. The schoolhouse they were using was inadequate due to the changes that were happening in the community. And so on uh, December 30th, 1906, there was a dedication service to the new house of worship. But there was a problem being right next to the school because the condominium brick building that we know was being built in that same year. And so all of a sudden, for 10 years, the uh, trustees found themselves with a steady job, unpaid, attending the meetings of the school board to report broken windows and other damage to the buildings. I guess kids are the same, right? Every generation. So after 10 years of grief, the, the school board said, uh, why don't we just buy the property from you? And an agreement was reached, and the church stayed, but the parsonage that was just a little north of the church was moved over here to 3rd and Harris, to the back end of the lot where the Christian education wing sits. You see, with the help of the American Baptist Home Missionary Society, the church was able to purchase the property of what's called 201 East 3rd Street, where the Fellowship Hall is, um, from... A, Frank and Elizabeth Omar, and in doing that, um, they built what the paper called the New Baptist Temple. 
never thought of it as a temple, but they called it the New Baptist Temple. And when they dedicated it on January 23, 1916, the mortgage was completely paid. There seems to be a pattern because we have no mortgage when we built this wonderful worship center because we trusted God. 1918, when the fire wiped out 205 homes in Clay Elm and 23 businesses or 24 businesses, this church building survived. It's amazing. Well, just down the street, just a month before, the First Presbyterian Church of Clay Elm was formed, and we talk a little bit about First Presbyterian because they're integral to the history of the Clay Elm Community Church. September 17th, 1899, they were formed with the help of the Mount Pisgah Presbyterian Church, which is still in Roslyn today, operating as Roslyn Presbyterian Church. By 1906, though, it's interesting that Roslyn Baptist, Roslyn First Baptist, no longer exists. But there was something early about the hearts of the people who were founding these churches, because they wanted to spread the gospel, they wanted to share the gospel, they were looking forward for opportunities to tell people about Jesus Christ. So both churches, First Baptist and First Pres, allowed their pastors to serve multiple locations. The Baptist pastors of the Best Air Record Show served a church in Easton, as well as a church at Lake Ketchelis. No, Ketchis, not Ketchelis, Ketchis. They were there during the building of the dam. And by the way, when the dam was completely built, the builders turned around and gave them the organ to bring down to the church for worship here. Presbyterians served multiple locations. They formed what was called in 1915 the Greater, they're called the Cascade Parish, and they served Roslyn, Clay Elm, South Clay Elm, Ronald, P.O. Point, I haven't figured out where that location was, Jonesville, Jonesville's under the lake by the dam up at Lake Clay Elm, and they say, Ronald, one pastor serving the circuit. Another interesting point is, in May of 1927, First Baptist Church of Clay Elm had re- receiving from the denominational entities some type of salary support, and in May of that year, they became self-supporting on the pastor's salary. By 1930, in July, they, uh, we have a lot of short-term pastorates early in the ministry. Some of that's because the, the work was hard here, the territory was hard, but they also had this thing called an annual vote on the pastor. They re-elected him every year, and in July of 1930, First Baptist said, we're not doing that anymore, and abolished the practice, and set up contingency plans for how you handle conflict in the church. First Baptist, though, continued to work with other churches in the community. And I found this picture, it's a little hard to see, it's one of the few, this is the earliest picture of our church that I could find in the records. It is 1936, the Nazarene Church, and First Baptist are doing a joint vacation Bible school. And that's the front of our building. World events were happening. There was a depression going on. There was mines were starting to close as the railroads started going to diesel fuel and not using the soft coal that was being mined in the Roslyn area. The coming of World War II left the churches often struggling and seeking direction. So May 10th, 1941, Presbyterian churches of South Clay Elm and Clay Elm merged. They were already sharing a pastor with Rosalind under what became known as the Greater Parish of the Cascades. And that was just a revival of the Cascade Parish of the 1915s, which had ended roughly 1920-21. But this is where it gets really interesting for us. Because the summer of 1941 saw major changes developing. First Pres and First Baptist of Clay Elm started holding meetings about how to merge. And by September 13th, 1941, what was called the Baptist Presbyterian Community Church adopted Articles of Confederation. And for a few years, they operated under the name Baptist Presbyterian, sometimes Federated Church, sometimes Community Church. But quickly, they dropped this idea, and we became uh, doing business as Clay Elm Community Church. In 1944, wanting to really truly be a community church, they already had this complicated procedure where some people could be Baptists and some people could be members by being Presbyterian. They decided they wanted people of all faith to come in. 
who were followers of Jesus Christ who professed him as Savior. And so they formed this thing in 44 called an associate membership. And so that's why all of a sudden you had Lutherans and former Catholics and Nazarene and Pentecostals and, oh, I, am I missing people? Yeah, other types of Baptists could all start coming here because we were trying to be a community of faithful people. And that began this thing that really affected my life because they started agreeing to share pastors. Every other pa pastor would be a Presbyterian or a Baptist. And they rotated. So in 1999, it was the Baptist turn. And you got me. But in 1966, the community church saw a need for reaching children and adults for Christ. The, the mines had closed, the, mill, the Miller Miller had closed down. And, but there was a growth in some kids. Donna can talk about this. She was a Sunday school teacher back then. They decided they needed to build an education wing to help train people, kids and adults, to be followers of Jesus Christ. So in 66, they tore down the parsonage, which, uh, by the way, Bev Ballard, who used to live in it when her dad was the pastor here, told me it was <clears throat> in need of being torn down. <laughs> they built the education wing, completing it in 1967. And so, when I came, this is what the church looked like. Well, this is a little later because Mrs. Tainer's house to your right is gone in that first picture. This gives you kind of the inside. Two, 2004, we started repairing a crumbling foundation. Then we put in a handicap ramp, and we have the groundbreaking ceremony for this worship center in September of 07. Then you can start seeing the construction. I just, I just love that one there. You see how those tr roof trusses are really blowing in the wind? It was December. It was cold. And there we go. Some more pictures of just what's happening all the way to the dedication in August of 08. Let's go back to that for a second. But then another ma major change happened in the life of the church. July 31st, 2011, marks a big day in the history of the church. It's a watershed event. The Greater Parish of the Cascade Agreement was terminated. As the Roslyn Presbyterian Church and the Clayton Community Church decide to each go their own way. Changes in denominational vision and direction were occurring, making it an untenable agreement. The partnership wasn't going to thrive. So what happens now is each church has the opportunity to have one pastor serving and leading the vision of that church. So let me explain this to you in a different way. In a long, long time ago, I was a manager of a Burger King when I was doing my Jonah impersonation. You've heard me talk about my Jonah impersonation. I can tell you when you serve two churches that each have a different vision, it's like you're a manager of a Burger King and you're a manager of a McDonald's. Now, both of them are fast food hamburger joints, but you know each one of them operates under a different paradigm of how they cook their food, how they handle their food. They have different models of operation. Could you imagine being a manager of both of those? And so what this did was it allowed each church to find a pastor who was called by God to serve them individually for the growth of the kingdom, for the betterment of the community. And with that, the 70-year history of the church's sharing, one pastor ended. Now, something about this church you need to know is missions has always been part of the DNA. We were a mission-founded churches. And I have several slides here. We're not going to talk about all of them. But I want you to see, down through the ages, as I went through the church records, who we've supported over the years. Actually, our denomination, Hunger Baptist Mission, and through United Missions for years, Northwest region. We still do that. We just had a collection for the international ministries. And by the way, thank you for all your gifts. It looks like we're going, the matching funds are coming in from you that we're donating matching funds at the full $2,500. So that's pretty exciting. We've helped with uh, new church planning, Val Yakima Valley Hispanic ministries for a season. This church made up a good third or more of the uh, Young Life Committee and then even my wife served as the Young Lives leader, being hired by Young Life to handle uh, and minister to teen moms. 
1979 in May, we started with AA. AA still meets back out here in the public assembly room in the garage that we created for them. And it's an ongoing ministry because so many people have come through recovery and AA to Jesus Christ. We support the food bank and coal, one great hour sharing, America for Christ. For a season, we did Operation Christmas Child. You make those little shoe boxes. Angel Tree Project, which works with Prison Fellowship. Gideon's, you know, you can read them all. CareNet, always believe in the sanctity of life. Community Builders. Union Gospel Mission, Native American Outreach. We've done three or four different Kenya trips in different seasons. We supported MOPS. Kaleidoscope is one of our new ones. New ministries, and of course, there's Manifest. But I want to come down and end when we talk about missions, the mission trip at Othello. Uh, right after I got here, Roger and Hockey Denny were attending the Presbyterian Church in Roslyn. They'd retired over here to, to Roslyn. And uh, they came to me and told me about what Lake City Presbyterian, under their leadership, had been doing for years. For probably 30 years at that point, they would take their summer vacation and go one week to Othello and do VBS in a box. And they would share Jesus Christ to the kids in the migrant camps. Most of those kids weren't coming into town to go to any of the Othello Church's VBS. They were kind of isolated. So in 2004, I was there when this kids are off doing one of their things, and this mother, this mother comes up, and uh, she was probably in her mid-30s, had little kids, and she says, you know, when I was a kid that age, this group came from Seattle somewhere, and they shared Jesus Christ. And I gave my life that day to Christ. I'm looking at hockey and tears are flowing down her face. Because it was Lake City Presbyterian and Roger and Hockey who had given total over 40 years of their life to doing that type of mission work. It was their ministry. And the lady goes on to say, and now today I'm worship leader at the Hispanic church just south of Othello. You know, there are times we don't know we don't know what God is using for us. Missions has always been a part of this church. When I came here, community church tried to budget between 16 to 18 percent of their budget to missions. This year for 2024, we're at 17 percent, and really that's just what we put in the budget, because. Decades ago, and I mean decades ago, long before I was here, this church created a policy that says, if we go over our budgeted giving for the year, we get excess gifts coming in, we will tithe on that to our mission groups. And so if at the end of the year, you'll see that we really will exceed that 17%. And that's all for the glory of God because we're connecting with groups to help people share Jesus Christ. And then I just want to quickly show these. They're hard to read, I know, this. But this is the, the list starting with First Baptist Church of Clay Ellum. The names are in the booklet that we handed out. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Walter Jennings. Walter Jennings believed that he had the authority of Scripture to preach the Word and declare the Word of the Lord. So one Sunday, he talked about all the saloons in town and the evils of alcohol. One evening, late, a little bit later after that, <clears throat> a bunch of angry miners, loggers, whatever they were, actually jumped him and was beating him to death because he declared the word of the Lord. Our hero, Thomas Milburn Jones, I was telling you about, the found, one of the founders of the church, he hears what's going on. He runs to that scene, and I want to meet this guy in heaven, because he runs to that scene, and he says, gentlemen, disperse, and the crowd left. <laughs> I don't know if a crowd would leave if I came in and said, stop that. Unfortunately, um, Reverend Jennings never really recovered and died a few years later in a hospital because of a traumatic brain injury. In the 20s, we have uh, Wesley Smith. He went to help a friend and a parishioner with doing some thrashing, and somehow an accident occurred, and he literally got scalded and died on the mission field. 
He was just being the hands and feet of Jesus. There we go. The other one I wanted to talk about a little bit is uh, Reverend Richard Hughes Litherland. He was here. It was his first uh, church assignment out after seminary. <laughs> he tried to combine the churches. That didn't work. <laughs> he was doing a bunch of stuff, but the city of Clay Ellum decided they wanted to open up all the houses of prostitution again. And Reverend Litherland stepped into the gap and preached the word of the Lord. He wrote in a letter to us for our 100th anniversary the following. At Clay Elm Roslyn, I learned the prophetic stances in the pulpit result in both victories and defeats in the community. Opposing the reopening of the houses of prostitution was easier than restoring coal mining jobs. Interesting, huh? And there's the list, some more names. Uh, We've had pastors who arranged from one month here. He got the call of God, came. His wife wouldn't come from California, so he left after a month. We've had some stay three. Average tenure of a pastor in this church over the 125 years is 2.8, but prior to 1899, I mean 1999, 2.2 years. But the reason why I tell you a lot about these people, and I, I want to say is, I honor these men because they laid a foundation of the word of God that made it possible for us to do what we do today. We have to build on them. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an excerpt builder but now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have in Jesus Christ. Paul understood something. We build on those who went before us. And here, I think, is one of the most important verses, because I see it throughout the history in little snippets. You know, when you read the minutes of all these meetings, you, you learn a lot of facts, but it's all about business for the most part, and they're documenting some historical things. But you see the trace elements of the movement of God and how pastors declared the word of the Lord and what they chose to do and not do. And so I bring this to 2 Timothy, Paul writing to Timothy, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Patty preached that 25 years ago in my installation service. It still applies today. It's applied throughout the history of the church. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. William Jennings died because he preached the word of the Lord, and people weren't going to listen to solemn and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires. They will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of the suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news. Notice that. Work at telling others the good news. And fully carry out the ministry God has given you. We have been called by God to continue to take the good news of Jesus Christ to other people. So what are we going to do for the future? Well, let me just throw a few more slides up here for you. Hey, look at that. A few years ago, we decided that we believe the way the economy is going, there comes a day when we might have to feed people. There will be a day, actually, when we will feed people more than just at Manifest and at Gopi Feast dinners. We are going to have to help serve the community. We knew our kitchen was inadequate, so God laid a vision on people's hearts. There we go, starting the foundation. There's, isn't that gorgeous wallpaper up there in that one picture? Yeah. We still have a couple pieces if anybody needs it. <laughs> Building. And then you can see where it is today. Drywall just being hung this week. Actually yesterday. You see, that comes back to this as we share the word of the Lord. Through the prophet Isaiah, God says, share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. That's a hard one at times, isn't it? Uh, 
Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. The reason why we want to serve people is sometimes you have to give them physical bread of life to introduce them to the eternal bread of life. Because Jesus, when he was tempted by Satan, said this. Satan said, look, dude, you're hungry. You've just been fasting 40 days. Take some of those stones over there and turn them into nice croissants or buttermilk biscuits, maybe a bagel. And he says, no. I live because every word that proceeds from the mouth of God gives me life. Jesus declared that he was the bread of life. We help people physically at times with the sole purpose of making sure that eventually we introduce them to the Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to speak to them as Jim prayed. We need to declare it because faith comes from hearing the word of God. That's the only way people will ever give their heart to Christ and believe in that heart and confess with their mouth. Every generation, this church has had a vision and made efforts to share Jesus with the community. In my 25 years, we've actually had several visions of our church vision statement, but they centered all around one theme as we tried to get something that was easy to remember and something that people could remember. Because trust me, as a wordsmith, I had a couple there that were really long. The whole center theme is sharing Jesus with others to help people become followers of Jesus so their lives can be changed. For 125 years, CECC has been striving to make Jesus known in community, to make a difference for Jesus, to help people connect to Jesus, to help them have an intimate personal relationship with the living God that can change and transform their life to get to know the God who loves to answer prayers and loves to care for his people. You see, this side of eternity, we may never know the impact of our ministries on how we impacted someone's life or the difference we've made. And the history of the Cleon Community Church is filled with these type of stories, people helping others find Jesus as Savior. It was interesting for the records that we could find because there are several years where records are completely missing. In the records we found, this church has seen or ministered or however you want to say it, 315 baptisms. That's people coming to faith, declaring Jesus Christ, and are baptized. There's about 30, to 40, 30 or 40 years of records that are missing, so there might be a bunch more that we don't know about. It. But it's kind of cool. 315 baptisms. That doesn't include med- weddings that were established and homecoming ceremonies that were celebrated for believers. All through that, we've been trying to cast this vision. It's God's call. It's the call he's made to every church since he began, telling the church what to do. Connect people to Jesus. And that's our goal as we start the next 125 years, right? 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 As we start the next 125 years, we want to be a church known for connecting people to a living Savior who is Jesus Christ. So that's why I share this verse with you. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Clay Elum, South Clay Elum, Roslyn, Ronald, throughout Upper Kittitas County, Kittitas County, Washington State, and to the ends of the earth. Look it up in Acts 1.8. We want the power of the Holy Spirit that's already available to us, that's living within us as a believer, to empower us to be bold in our life, how we live, and what we say, so that others will see the witness of Christ in our lives and be drawn to him and experience an eternal saving relationship with the living God. That's why we're here. That's why we've always been here. That's why Thomas Milburn Jones helped plant the church. And we want to continue that legacy into the future. Father God, we just thank you for all that you say and do. And Lord, may these uh, words inspire us from Acts 1-8 to continue the legacy of what we saw in the past. A church that really is committed to sharing Jesus Christ with others. So Lord, speak to us now. Give us the confidence to go boldly out into the community to share you with others. 
And Father God, if someone is really struggling, they've been trying to find their way to God, this is a time to understand that God wants to put the living water in you, that he wants to satisfy your deepest longings and take away the pain and the exile of your life so that you may have a relationship with him. Would you ask him to be your savior? Would you ask him to forgive your sins? Would you ask him to be the king of your life? Give your allegiance to Jesus. Thank you, Father, for all that you're going to do. In the name of Christ. Amen.